Hi everyone, thanks for coming along tonight. Uh, my name is Hayley Brandis and um, my husband and I have a beautiful 16 year old daughter with autism and PDA and a gorgeous uh, 11 year old son who is neurotypical. I'm so happy to be able to share our story with you tonight um, as recognition of PDA in Australia has been a long time coming. On that note, I'd really like to thank Dr. John Ray um, for his role in um, having PDA included in the new national guidelines for autism diagnosis. So our story. From day one in 2001, life for Mia was very difficult. Um, she was a very unsettled baby and she hardly slept day or night. My husband and I didn't sleep one full night until well after Mia did when she was 19 months old and that's 580 nights if you're interested. Um, to be honest, I don't know how my husband kept working for that year and a half and or how I went back to work part time when Mia was 15 months old without having more than um, about an hour of sleep at a time over that period. Uh, from a very unsettled baby, she became one almighty toddler. Um, she was very entertaining, articulate, headstrong, and she kept us on our toes. Uh, one day, when she was almost two, I hope you can see that clearly, um, so she wasn't, wasn't even two, we were down at the beach, it was um, sunset time, and she pointed at the sunset and said to me, Mum, is that not the most spectacular sunset you have ever seen in your entire life? And I was just gobsmacked and I thought, wow, my child's brilliant. Um, and she is. She's amazing. Um, as Kindy approached, she was struggling with handwriting and running and lots of other motor tasks. So uh, we booked her in to see an occupational therapist for an assessment. I'm also an OT, uh, but I'd never worked in paediatrics. And I was struggling to um, make sense of things and manage her behaviour. So the OT suggested that we get a psych involved. Um, so we went to see Kim Psych, who's apparently very good at diagnosing autism in girls. So they did a little pretend play activity with some plastic toy animals, and Mia had a little giraffe, and the psychologist had a bat, and uh, Mia was giving little giraffe words and voicing his feelings. And then the psychologist flew the bat down to the table to join the giraffe for a little bit of fun together. And uh, Mia's first comment to the bat was, what are you doing here, Mr. Bat? Don't you know that you're nocturnal? <laughs> and she wasn't even three then. Um, she then promptly refused to continue the session as she knew that it wasn't believable that a bat could be out in daytime. <laughs> um, Autism was never mentioned, but that was just the start of a number of psychologists who have seen um, telling us to use consequences for her behaviour when she wasn't cooperative. I'm not bad with psychologists, I'm married to a fabulous one, um, but this was just our experience that I wanted to share with you. I think it illustrates some of the things that John said about the difficulty of recognition. So um, we were told to use con consequences, reprimands, uh, behaviour charts, discipline, star charts, stickers. That was not a success, to put it mildly. Um, every sticker, every chart, every picture that I lovingly laminated and velcroed and made cork boards, they all ended up in the bin. And Mia was not a fan. Uh, perhaps because she made good eye contact and she was highly verbal, a very advanced language, so none of the language delay that is sometimes seen in these kids. Um, and she was able to engage in lots of pretend play. Uh, maybe because of that, the other autism signs were missed. Um, there were repetitive behaviours which continue to this day. Um, she had very narrow interests and her communication wasn't actually that reciprocal. Um, she's very good at speaking at people um, and directing others as well. So by that stage, we started getting called in uh, to family daycare, then kindy, then four-year-old kindy, then pre-primary, got a couple of teachers <laughs> nodding. Um, and the teachers didn't mince their words. Uh, they weren't happy with Ms. behaviour, it was unacceptable, and we needed to fix it, my husband and I. She wouldn't join in with groups, she refused to do activities that the other kids were doing. Um, she appeared very bright, but she wasn't compliant, and she refused to do any activities that she perceived that she wasn't good at like sport. 
she was pretty charismatic and very entertaining, but she dominated the social interactions with her peers because of her need to maintain control. We brought in Clint Sykes and occupational therapists into the school, and they had lots of great ideas for how to engage Mia and how to assist with her emotional and social regulation. Um, but they were actually pretty much ignored. Um, we bought bean bags and fidget toys and fidget spinners and wobble cushions and all the sensory toys. Uh, they weren't given to Mia or used, which we found out later. We were continually criticised by staff and principals and judged pretty harshly by other parents as well. School was an ongoing source of stress. Uh, one principal said to us, you will never get schools plus funding, there's no point in applying. The next principal said, we all just need to tell Mayor to try harder. I thought, oh, there we go, we've solved everything. That would be nice. Actually, after a visit to our local MP, we got 0.9 full-time equivalent funding for an education assistant for Mayor. So I highly recommend that as a strategy, as a strategy to get what help your child needs. I probably won't be popular for saying that, but that's okay. That's what they're there for, is to help you. Um, by the time she was five, my husband and I worked out that Mia was probably somewhere on the autism spectrum. Um, so we joined a very long wait list to see the lovely Dr Ray. And 15 months later, uh, together with the clinical psych and the speech, he confirmed that Mia was indeed on the spectrum. Uh, she was in grade one at that point, age six and a half. And that which meant that we missed out on the Faxia funding, the Helping Children with Autism package, which provides $12,000 worth of therapy support, um, but only until the child is six. So, uh, to me that's ludicrous, because Mia did not grow out of her autism at age six, and neither do, does anyone else on the spectrum, as far as I'm aware, and she wasn't even diagnosed until she was six and a half. So, I realise that girls are particularly hard to diagnose, for a range of reasons, which I haven't got time to cover, but um, my understanding is thanks to an academic group who advised the government that early intervention is very useful from zero to six years old. In their wisdom, they cut the funding from age six onwards. They do provide um, funding for subsidised um, therapy for 20 sessions over a lifetime if the child's older than six, but that ain't much. You can use that up in a couple of months. Another difficult thing that happened that year was that uh, her year one teacher said in front of me to another teacher, it looks like anyone can get an autism diagnosis these days if you've got enough money, which I found deeply offensive. Uh, it was nine years ago and I still remember exactly how I felt. And I just thought that showed a total lack of compassion and support. Uh, the following couple of years brought great frustration uh, for us in the form of many, many psych appointments. Um, at $180 to $220 a pop, um, none of which really achieved anything, as every psych that we saw who were able to help other people. I know hundreds of families with kids with autism, and they do help a lot, but they weren't helping us. Um, they all took a behaviour management approach, and that made things a lot worse. So we really needed one of these. <laughs> um, no goals were ever set or aimed for, um, no time frames were given, it was like we just handed over our credit card, here you go, help yourself, don't worry, we don't need anything back, you keep it. Uh, and in hindsight, and I know I sound bitter, but um, in hindsight, now I realise, you know, they knew nothing about PDA, and so they were operating on the information that they knew about. So. Um, the, but the major issue that arose was Mia's severe anxiety and her inability, not unwillingness, to cooperate with any requests or suggestions or demands or even attempts at engagement. Would you like to come for dinner, Mia? My legs don't work. It's time to get dressed for school, school now, darling. I'm not going to school. I'm too tired. It's too hot, too cold, etc. Um, here you go, I cut off an apple for you. I didn't tell you I wanted an apple. I hate apples, even though she loves them. But just the fact that I was offering it to her actually caused her stress and anxiety. Uh, life became something of a battleground, pretty much 24 hours a day. Uh, she developed severe anxiety at age around seven or eight. 
And that was after years of feeling highly pressured um, and stressed both at home and at school. And um, her academic performance went down, her anxiety went up, and her self-esteem went down. We really couldn't leave the house as a family. She really needed one-to-one -one attention all the time. If we tried, um, it was always ended in severe distress to the point where she got very agitated and ultimately could become aggressive if she felt deeply anxious. Um, we pulled her out of school. Uh, that was one of the local public primary schools where she'd been for five years. We tried homeschooling for six months. Um, I'll take my hat off to the homeschoolers that I see in the audience. Um, we lasted six months. It wasn't successful. Um, great homeschooler. Uh, we then enrolled her at a small private independent school near us uh, where the teacher told me after the first week that she could fix the issues easily that we were dealing with. And believe me, taking on someone with PDA, with the attitude that I'm bigger than you and you have to do what I say, that ain't gonna work at all. And you end up with a whole lot more problems. So things got a lot worse and we had to withdraw her um, because we had daily school refusal at that point. Again, um, Mia still talks about that teacher and remembers the way that she was treated or, and, and I was treated by that teacher, and this is six years later. Um, by coincidence, at that time, my sister who lives in Melbourne mentioned to a friend of hers who works at an autism school overseas, um, that we were having trouble getting Mia to comply and cooperate with just normal, everyday activities. Um, just mundane things, not really stressful events or demanding activities. Just brushing your teeth and putting your clothes on and trying to get outside the front door. So at this lovely lady said to my sister, that sounds a lot like pathological demand avoidance. My sister called me and I went straight to Dr. Google, as you do, and I was floored. Uh, this is what so many PDA parents describe as their light bulb moment. And we've all independently said that of each other. When I got onto the internet, I just kept finding that there's a light bulb moment. Wow. Finally finding something that describes and explains your child. I was really blown away. I watched a few YouTube videos, which I showed my family, um, by a parent called Neville Starnes in, the, uh, Starnes in the UK, and I felt like he had been living inside our house for nine years, which is a very strange feeling. <laughs> um, and I discovered that there was going to be a PDA conference in Manchester in a couple of months. My amazing mum, my mother-in-law and father-in-law looked after Mia, who was nine, and my four-year-old. Um, for I think it was about eight days while my husband worked and my incredibly wonderful father um, not only funded the whole expedition but came with me to England to learn more. I promise I'm going to cry. Um, I'll be forever grateful for that trip. Oops. It was life changing for all of us. And in Manchester I learned for the first time that we weren't alone. Sorry, Anne, now I've got yours. <laughs> um, there were hundreds of kids like ours. There wasn't all over the world. There were 400 people at that conference. And I think that was the first PBA conference. It was just a whole new world. And I realised why we have been feeling like this for so long. We discovered why the strategies that we've been trialling for the last six or seven years, which seemed to work well for other kids on the spectrum, <sighs> Sorry. Weren't well, working for us, and they actually made things significantly worse. By giving her direct commands and timetables and visuals and routines and consequences, and using timers and all the things that everyone would us to do, um, we were giving her little or no choice, no control, no flexibility, no understanding of her intents and constant anxiety which must have been so awful for her. I felt like I'd learned a new language overnight. Everything suddenly just made so much sense to us. So this is the bit you've come for. What did they teach us in England? Okay. Um, what works really well for us is humour. And Mia has an absolutely brilliant sense of humour and uh, the ruder, the better. Um, so that really 
breaks the tension, diffuses things. And uh, my husband's much better at this than I am, but <laughs> it helps so much uh, when things are starting to go pear-shaped. Uh, distraction worked really well when Mia was little. We could distract her fairly easily um, with all sorts of things. Doesn't work now, she's too smart. These are key things, reducing, disguising your demands um, and giving indirect demands is probably sounds, you know, a bit aggressive, but it, it just means requests, any sort of engagement with them. Um, so basically reducing everything non-essential and that's really hard to do, especially when you're parenting another child at the same time, it doesn't have PDA. So throwing everything out the window that you thought that you should do and be as a parent um, and everything that you expected of that child and just picking the key most important things, deciding what they are and sticking to those and let everything else go. Um, using indirect demands, um, and I think uh, Anne and Joe will talk about those as well, but we found when she was little playing dumb was really helpful. Oh, I can't figure out how to do this. I wonder if anyone else knows how to do it. But that type of thing worked really well. Again, it doesn't work anymore. She's, uh, she turned 16 this week, so it's pretty clever for us. Um, Depersonalising demands. Um, that might be a mother's slide, sorry. By blaming other people, we find that's really helpful. You know, Dr Ray said, we have to do this. Yeah. <laughs> it really helps to blame other people and not being the bad guy yourself. Yeah. Mm. Um, ignoring unwanted behaviour, and we get lots and lots and lots of unwanted behaviour. We try and ignore it. Um, appealing to them to help you if they're in a good mood, they, you never know. Um, working in collaboration together as an alliance and using we language, you know, let, let's try and solve this together. Um, I sometimes feel like this poor fellow here, um, and I think flexibility is so important that we we are able to be flexible around their needs, that they are not necessarily able to be flexible around ours, which we often expect of children to just do what we say because we're the parents and the boss. We need to be flexible around them. Other things that are helpful are to provide warm and quiet reassurance, is a calm and neutral body language and voice. I find very difficult. I have Mediterranean blood. <laughs> it's very difficult to be calm and relaxed and neutral when you are feeling like, you know, your blood's boiling. It's very hard to do. Um, building your relationship together when things are going well is critical. Um, John mentioned the importance of that relationship for success at home and at school and, and otherwise. Um, offering choices, usually a couple that you're happy with, is great when they're happy. If they're agitated or anxious, offering them choices will piss them off and upset them. So it's not recommended. Um, use of exercise is great if you can get them to do it. Mia's been going to a fabulous personal trainer for six years, uh, who we started seeing when I was homeschooling her and she used to go five days a week and she's still going three times a week now and that's a testament to the trainer as well, as Mia. Um, we think that's been invaluable. Um, medications, that's another, another two hour talk, another day. Um, educating all the people around you about what works and what doesn't work with your child or student. Um, and just sharing PDA strategies with others, very useful. One thing is if you can help it, never say no or you can't, because that just sets them off immediately. You need to find other language to get around that. That's just an instant red rag. One of the most useful things that I learned in England, and this comes from the Christie book that uh, John mentioned, um, and that's the concept of tolerance and, and demand dials, like speedos. And it's absolutely critical that these match. So what this relates to is the demands placed on the child by the parent or teacher or whoever's working with them. Uh, so the level of demand that goes up and down and uh, the tolerance of the child to those demands. And if the child's tolerance is up, they're happy, they're relaxed, low arousal, not particularly anxious, 
you can, in fact, engage them much more and get much more out of them, which is really critical at school. But if they are highly anxious, agitated, um, and shutting you down, being really uncooperative, you need to wind this right back, or you're going to have a big clash. Absolutely critical that those two match. So learning about the strategies um, to try with a child with PDA, and that was the only book that existed um, at the time when, when we worked out that Mia was somewhere in this area. Um, I read the book, went to the one day conference in England, and I came home and things were not perfect, of course. It has taken us years to get the hang of all the strategies, and in fact we're still learning every day. Um, as I said, Mia just turned 16, and we are changing and learning every day because one of the really frustrating things about PDA is that what worked yesterday didn't work today. But it might work in three months and it might work in three years. So you need to have a whole toolkit available to try different things. But I feel like, uh, and I know other parents feel like this, you're constantly dancing, trying to work out uh, which steps are the right ones, what music's playing today, and, and the speed of the music changes, and the lighting changes, and the venue moves, and the time of the class, your dance class got changed, but no one told you. So you just feel like that all the time, chasing around. Um, it's a constant juggle, and it sometimes feels like you're walking on eggshells that have been perched on the top of a volcano. It's not much fun. Um, it's really not easy for anyone, especially the child with PDA. And of course, all the people who love them and work with them, um, you, your partner, siblings, um, extended family. And then if you throw in a bit of financial stress or maybe your relationship's not going too well or you're already separated or divorced, um, maybe your job's not secure. Um, all the normal relationship stresses, any health worries, aging parents, midlife crisis here or there, and our boy is life challenging. There are three other issues that I really would have liked to have covered today. One is schooling, and by the way, my daughter now goes to school full time. Um, she's been at um, an, another independent school for the last five years. She started very part time and gradually increased, and she has full time support at school. Um, she's in year 10. And the second one is the impact of PDA on siblings. Again, another whole workshop. And also the dreaded teenage years, which, yes, I won't say anymore. <laughs> so again, another whole topic, but very, very difficult time. Um, now for the juicy stuff. How do you cope as parents? And I know health professionals uh, may still enjoy, or education professionals, I still enjoy some of these ideas. I think they're good for everybody. Um, we've put these lists together for you, which are in your handouts. I've put a few um, pretty photos up here for some ideas for you. Um, these come from us and from the, face, the Australian PDA Facebook page and other um, international pages as well. People said, I asked the question, how do you cope? And people said they garden, they walk the dog, this is me at the top there. Um, volunteer work, um, going bush walking, reading a book, red wine. The last one, I wasn't sure about that picture, I thought people are going to suggest that I'm saying clean your house for therapy, but I'm not. I'm going to say get a house cleaner, if you can afford it. Absolutely get a house cleaner, lifesaver. Um, other things that people have said help are going back to work in part time, uh, running. Antidepressant medication, listening to music, taking up a hobby, or returning to an old hobby like quilting, this person. Uh, yoga, listening to audio books, having healthy meals delivered, one person said, which I thought was a great idea. Um, getting Netflix, getting out into nature, and counselling, support counselling. Um, and I've qualified that a bit in the um, handout by saying, Please see a qualified psychologist who's doing evidence-based therapy with you. I won't say anything else. <laughs> that might be contentious. Um, one more quick one. Um, if it's hard to get, it's hard to find. If you can get funding, get it. It makes your life a lot easier. If anyone's got any funding questions, come and grab me afterwards. There is funding available, but it's tricky. Okay, 
Um, we've also given you a list um, in your handouts there of useful resources, books, videos, Facebook groups, blogs, um, upcoming webinars, which I hope will be helpful. Um, so please, please, please give yourself a day off or a few hours off every now and again. Read some of this material, watch a YouTube video, um, learn something. We can all just keep learning all the time. There's always something you can do to help. Um, there's some great interviews online. There are fantastic blogs of adults with PDA and also parents of children with PDA. There's loads of them. Some of them are referenced on your handout. Um, and um, has Anne Rose has put together a fabulous ANZ PDA website, which she'll tell you more about fairly briefly. Um, I'd really encourage you to have a look at it because it's the only Australian PDA information available. Um, and so it's wonderful that she started that. Please join the PDA Australia um, page on Facebook. We've got a 560 members, um, which is it's a really active and really supportive group. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge um, Anne, who's been on a one-woman mission to educate the entire country about PDA. She's doing phenomenal things. Um, she's written to so many people, and she's making great inroads into raising awareness of PDA um, in professional circles, and I'd just like to acknowledge her for her enormous effort. I just want to remind you that when kids are least lovable, that's when they need your compassion, your understanding and your love the most. I'd encourage you to educate yourself um, with as many strategies as you possibly can so that you've got that toolkit ready to go to give you the best chance of supporting your child and surviving. Um, and I also really think it's worth stopping every now and again to reflect and see if there's been some positive changes over time because it's really easy to get bogged down in every tiny decision dancing backwards and forwards all day every day. Um, you sometimes forget to celebrate those positive things and a, a friend actually told me to say that in here which I thought was great because she said to me don't forget your beautiful daughter is a very talented artist. She's planning to study animation at uni. She speaks and reads Japanese fluently. Oh. She has an incredibly razor sharp wit, which is just fabulous, and she brings us great joy. Um, my take home message that I'd like you to remember, because apparently people remember one thing this is me. <laughs> First chocolate. That's not actually what I want you to remember. But what I really want you to remember is when you are struggling, stop. Drop everything. School, therapy, activities, going out, everything. Just stop. Take a long, slow, deep breath. Actually, I forgot the most important thing. The most important thing to stop and drop is your expectations. Take a breath, read or watch or listen to something about PDA. Pick a strategy to try and start again. I'd really like to thank Taryn Harvey, Mary Butterworth, Lisa Dockery and Teresa Presilio, I said that right, from DDWA and Maxine, thank you, uh, for their support in hosting this seminar tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank my incredible husband for his unlimited patience and support, um, my parents and my parents-in-law for everything that they've done to help us on our journey. Uh, finally, I know that it wasn't easy for some of you to get here tonight, so thank you for making the time and the effort. Uh, I really hope that this has been helpful for you at home or at work. Thank you very much.